is running. just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Dr. Russell Kirk, who was born in Union City, Tennessee, and lived in West Tennessee throughout his childhood. After graduating from Obion County High School in 85, he completed his undergraduate training at the University of Tennessee Martin in 1990. He attended the University of Tennessee College of Dentistry and graduated with honors in 94. Immediately upon completion of dental school, Dr. Kirk accepted a commission as a dental officer in the United States Navy. He became interested in the Naval Services after being awarded a health profession scholarship his last year of dental school. During his senior year, he was also selected by the Navy to participate in a one-year postgraduate residency in general dentistry. Dr. Kirk received a certificate for general practice residency from Naval Hospital Great Lakes in 95. After completing his Navy residency, Dr. Kirk served as a dental officer and department head for Naval Mobile Construction Battalion 4-0. During his tour with the CBs, he was based out of Port Hinnon, California, and completed deployments to Guam, Spain, Bosnia. He completed his active duty obligation in 97. Upon leaving active duty, Dr. Kirk was selected as one of two dentists for advanced training in anesthesia at the John Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore, Maryland. Dr. Kirk completed his fellowship in anesthesia and critical care medicine from John Hopkins in 88. After advanced postgraduate training in oral maxillofacial surgery was obtained at the University of Tennessee Memphis and Regional Medical Center in Memphis, Tennessee. He received a certificate in oral maxillofacial surgery in June of 2002. Dr. Kirk began practicing in Lebanon, Tennessee, 2002. In 2005, he was mobilized to active duty. He closed his private practice to serve as a staff oral maxillofacial surgeon at the United States Military Hospital in Kuwait in conjunction with Expenditure Medical Facilities Dallas. He returned home and reopened his practice in 2006. He opened a second office in Mount Juliet in 2007. Plans for renovation of this facility are underway. While maintaining his schedule at the office, Dr. Kirk remains very active in the United States Navy Reserve. He was promoted to the rank of captain in 2013. That means we can actually call you officially Dr. Captain yes, Kirk. Yes, sir. He is currently the senior executive for Ex. Expediture Medical Facility Great Lakes One. Dr. Kirk also remains active in hospital, dental, and civic activities in the surrounding community. He is an active member of the ADA, Tennessee Dental Association, Nashville, American Association of Oral Maxillofacial Surgeons, American Board of Oral Maxillofacial Surgery. It goes on and on and on. He's married to Dr. Anne Marie <laughs> Sutherland. They have two daughters, Presley Kate and Harper Grace. Oh my God, you must be a big Elvis fan. To have a uh, Presley and a, and we, a Grace. we are and one son Brennan James. His hobbies include training in Krav Magna and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Well, I'm glad we're we're doing this over Skype, so you're not here in person to kick my butt. But I actually called. <laughs> I actually contacted you. You did not contact me. I was. Um, I'm a big fan of your website ownermag.com uh, you have a podcast you're the only oral surgeon that I'm aware of uh, that has a podcast and uh, my gosh thanks for coming on the show how are you doing oh man it's an honor to finally be on here and and talking with you uh, virtually face to face Howard so so um, my gosh um, it seems like there's two kinds of kids out there they either um, just want to do soft and pretty stuff bleaching bonding veneers Invisalign or there's the blood and guts guys that want to pull teeth and do dentures and partials and, um, you know, place implants and all that. Um, what, what percent of dentists do you think um, are really cut out for oral surgery, blood and guts versus uh, just want to do soft and pretty stuff? Well, that's a, that's a tough one. I don't have a number. Uh, I know that locally here, we're in a rural, more rural community outside of Metro Nashville, and, and a lot of the guys around here are excellent surgeons, so they all play in that realm, uh, and both of them, actually. So I, I couldn't tell you an actual number who, who just does that for primary uh, purpose in their practice. Well, first I think of all, it I, takes I, a, a well, first of all, I want to thank you for your service, and um, and when that oh, uh, you're welcome, and that Kuwait thing popped up, and you had to close your practice down, go serve your country. Oh. I've read I've read that in America, uh, only less than one percent of Americans ever serve. Is that true? I think that's a pretty accurate number. Yes, Howard. And I don't think I've ever had a guest on my show that had to close down their office and go serve uh, the United States military. And uh, thank you so much for that. Was that a was that a huge burden economically and on your family and three kids? 
so I, I so we didn't have kids at the time and I'd only been in practice a couple of years so I, I did a startup and it was very near economically devastating to me but I had I'd played it well I'd saved enough money and so the practice loan I was able to just store my equipment come back to to open another day uh, it was it, at the time of course a lot of things in life when you go through those rough patches they're they're pretty uh, depressing but now I look back and it was a it was a good experience for me it was a it was a way to come back and restart fresh and I had made it several mistakes in my business and I was able to upright that and come back uh, with a little different opinion and a little different attitude toward how I would open my practice uh, the second time around and you know the best foundations are are built on rock bottom I know um, amen I'll- I mean, I know so many dentists have hit rock bottom, whether it's for divorce or criminal ju- dr- substance abuse, something, uh, or having to close down your practice, go serve the military, whatever. And it really gets you thinking more holistically. Than it get, allows you to see the big picture. Yeah, big picture. I think that's where our growth happens. I really do. I mean, when you get into those tough spots, and um, that's why I'm a fan of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. <laughs> it's taught me a lot, too. Yeah, and, and you know, another thing is what um, when you go back and you listen to podcasts on like a World War One or World War Two, it's funny how in my lifetime, nobody saw the prediction of the falling of the Berlin Wall, the Arab uprising, uh, 9-11. Uh, nobody, nobody uh, really saw the um, outbreak of World War One around the corner or World War Two. So when I start seeing these events like the other day when Venezuela and Russia was sending, don't, you know, don't mess with Venezuela and they were sending people. And, and you look at all these things and it's just like, um, you need to be prepared for the worst because I don't think in all of history, anybody can see around the corner. I mean, nobody was telling everybody in Europe, hey, there's a world war about to break out. So, you know, settle down and get debt free and, build a bomb shelter. Um, do, do you agree with that perspective that you never know when these hostile events are going to break out? I, I think so. I I think we have a better finger on our pulse. And I think really I, I had an opportunity to go through the Navy War College and I, ha- I have a little better understanding of that than what I did prior to going through that program. And it's, it's diplomacy, it's pushing your power, power forward. And I, I think it's all politically based. And I think they probably understand that a little bit more. We, we read history, but sometimes we don't learn from it. But I, I think the more recent stuff that's happened, I think that's a little bit more unpredictable. So, so tell us about your journey. Um, um, well, first of all, um, most of our viewers are uh, 25% are in dental school, the rest are under 30. There's only a very few old and senile people at my age that are listening to podcasts. They still read textbooks and, and newspapers. Um, what, what do you? What advice would you give these um, the, these young kids? Well, one thing I wanted to get ask about is uh, I'm out here in Arizona, and mm-hmm. there's there's a death out here. Every, I mean, it seems like every couple of years there's an anesthesia death by a general dentist. One was. One was the hygienist numbed up a kid for four quadrants of pediatric dentistry. And then when the dentist walked in the room, he didn't know the hygienist had numbed. So he renumbed four quadrants and the kid died of an anesthetic overdose. And of course those kids, you know, so that was just, but but other ones are pediatric dentistry um, where they're doing IV stage. I mean, you, you see these on Facebook all the time. And, and what, 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 yeah. do you, what do you think of kids that their whole life when they go to the hospital, the hospital would not allow the cardiovascular surgeon to do the IV and the bypass. They they split those jobs up. What do, what do you think about these kids learning IV sedation? And and um, do, do you think that's kind of over their head or, or should be a specialty or what, what do you think about that? So I come from I come from an anesthesia background with my time at Johns Hopkins. And I the, the thing that I see the most that was drilled upon us up there all the time was it's not if you have a complication it's when you have a complication so i think what you have to focus on is if you're going to do that is you really need to be comfortable with how you're going to bail yourself out should you get into a problem situation um i i think if you're properly trained and we all have different skill sets and we all have different reps and different procedures that we do and the more you can do and the more mentorship and the more education you can get, I think it's okay. I, I don't have a problem with it. Uh, where, I, where I see some bumps in the road is when we don't know what we don't know when it comes to these things. 
and we get a little overconfident. I'm guilty of it as well. And then, you know, the dental gods will humble us quickly. And so I, I give that I give that piece of advice. Just be sure that you're comfortable with the complications if you're going to go down that path. And uh, well, what uh, other thing? You you, you, you've had three kids. I had four. I mean, my gosh, my wife, my ex could deliver them in the middle of the night, and they just page an anesthesiologist, and they're they're right there for an epidural. Uh, to me, it, of course, I'm spoiled. I'm in Phoenix, a, a metro of four million people. Um, I just don't know why you would put yourself through all that training and risk if you could just have a board certified anesthesiologist show up at your practice. Literally, well, literally I mean, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So there are guys that do that. I know oral surgeons that that employ dental anesthesiologists. Um, is, it, is it a recognized specialty yet? No, is it coming? It's likely, I know it's been close a few times in, in the ADA from my understanding. So, I, you know, I think it's just a matter of time before that happens. Where I think in a lot of respects we probably mirror or at least parallel medicine, uh, or parallel medicine, not mirror it. But I think at some point this is all going to break out, and we're gonna we're gonna end up like medicine for the better or for the worse of it. Yeah. Um, so do when you um, you went to Memphis, um, do do you think the the kids are learning oral surgery properly uh, when they come out of dental school? Do you think when they come out four hundred thousand dollars in student loans? Uh, they're good in oral surgery, or do you think they need more advanced training, or what? What would you recommend on their journey out of dental kindergarten? So, so here's here's my take on that, and I speak I speak of this after going through those programs because I'm on the other side of those now. I don't think that we should be any different than medicine, and we should have residency programs to get those clinical skills honed and give us a little bit more understanding. And I'm okay with that. Now I know there's probably people that are counter that. That's fine. Everyone's subject to their own opinion, but I, I I think it works pretty well for the medical field. And and to do that, have an extra GPR, or AGD, or maybe a surgical externship, and uh, I don't think that's a problem. I think that's probably a good thing. So um, for for clinic for for clinical and business, Howard. I, I want to ask you something else. Um, there's kids who um, there's kids who extract teeth and don't place implants. Do you think? Um, do you, do you think that it, what would be harder for you to to place an implant a single implant on uh, replacing a mac uh, you know a, a, a first six year molar or an upper secondary bicuspid or removing a semi impacted wisdom teeth what what do, what do you think takes more advanced surgical skills I think probably the wisdom tooth removal so probably more so basically if you're listening to this right now and you're driving to work on your hour commute and you pull some impacted wisdom teeth but don't place implants you just heard it from an oral surgeon that you have more than skill necessary to place a uh replace a first molar or a maxillary second bicuspid i think they each have their own you know their their own set of complications again their own things that you have to be aware of and solid skills and foundational surgical skills are are going to get you there. So, so talk about your journey to um, your website, owner. I, I love the name owner. It's O W N R for owner. O N W N E R mag for magazine.com. You have another website, business of dentistry podcast.com. Talk about your journey and how, um, I mean, there's 5,000 oral surgeons in the United States mm -hmm. and you're the only one I know that migrated to the the podcast world. Talk about your journey and how, how did that happen? I started listening to podcasts and as I started listening to them, I, I was listening to a, a one called Six Figure Side Gig with Mark Costas, you know Mark. And I didn't even know he was a dentist. I was listening to him for entrepreneur advice and then one day I'm like, wait a minute, this guy's a dentist. Then I started looking for <laughs> dental podcasts. And as I listened to these, I'm like, you know, I wonder, I wonder what it would be like. So I started out with curiosity in the tech side of things. And as I started looking, I'm, I found a course. I'm like, I'll, I'll try to do this course and see if I can at least put a couple episodes together just, just to see if I can do it to take the challenge. And here we are later. I, I use a lot of my first episodes and even some today to just vent. I get on and just riffs, you know, about what happens during the week, what happens, you know, some positives, some negatives. And then I try to play off that and say, hey, this is where I used to think, this is what I did, this is what I would recommend not doing, I've, I've made that mistake, just to give people, I, I, what I found most, Howard, is people go, 
I'll get emails from them or I'll get uh, Facebook messages and they'll say, you know, I'm, I'm glad I'm not the only one in that in the, same, in the same situation. I'm glad there are other people. And I think that's the beauty of podcasting is we get off of that island of isolation if we're solo practice guys and gals. And I, I just found it fun. And I get to meet people like you and I've, I've had an opportunity to talk to people that I otherwise wouldn't have because of the podcast. So it's been a real good networking thing as well. You know, it was it was so funny because when um, when Jobs came out with the iPhone, which really started the the apps and all that in two thousand seven in podcasting, um, it was funny how Wall Street you know, was saying that um, the day of the hundred million dollar blockbuster movie is going to get slaughtered by user generated content. And now you look at the fact that uh, Google YouTube uploads enough content every day that you'd have to, it'd take you 2,000 years at 24 hours a day, seven days a week to listen to what's uploaded every day. So, wow. so, so it's neat that, you know, it used to be media had to go through these gates, you know, like yes. dental magazines or whatever, movies had to go through. Uh, you, you, you could film a movie and put it up on Hulu. And in fact, there's a new movie up there on Net, Netscape. I don't know. It's causing an uproar on Dental Town. Um, uh, Root Cause. Have you heard about that that movie on Netflix? Ah, no, I haven't. I think I know what it might be about, but go ahead and tell me. Uh, well, I mean, it's Root Cause, and these guys are saying, they're holistic dentists, saying that um, root canals have... Yeah. Uh, there, there's no other surgeon in the world that leaves a dead tissue in your body. And when they do a root canal, yes. the tooth is dead. They're leaving a dead tooth in there. And that's uh, 97% of all women who have breast cancer have a root canal tooth. And they're, they're making all these uh, statements. And it's really driving the townies insane on Dental Town. Um, but anyway, so I, uh, so it's funny. So I asked. Uh, some of my non-dentist friends here in Phoenix and every one of them that watch, I, I told them to watch it and tell me what they thought about it. And, what they thought. and every single one of them came back to me like, oh my God, those root canals are terrible. Should I have mine pulled? Oh. And it's like, wow. I wonder, uh, so um, yeah, I wish you would, uh, you, you should watch that show and do a podcast on your uh, owner mag or, or, uh, or I wonder if I could, if we could get those people on the, um, if you're listening to this and you know the dentists that were on Root Cause, they want to come on and talk about their show, that, that would be an amazing podcast. So what, what do you think about all this uh, holistic um, thoughts? I mean, there's anti-vaxxers, there's anti-root canalers, there's anti-metal. I mean, there, there's patients What's that are like, you know, what, what, what is this all coming to? So I think I, I go back, I fall back on my training. It, what, what's the science say? Show me the research, show me the science. Let me read that. Let, and then I think, you can give me that. I can compare it to what I have learned, and then I'll make my decision. But you got to show me the you got to show me the science, because that's what we all are, Howard. We're scientists. I mean, I know we're more than that, but it, at the end of the day, we're scientists, and so you've got to you got to bring that to the table, and it's got to be more substantial than just some anecdotal stuff. And I and I say that because I haven't seen the show, so. And talking talk about watch science, um, I I podcast interviewed uh, uh, an oral surgeon from Germany. And he was telling okay. me that they're more, quote, evidence-based dental research and that oral surgeons in Germany pull out significantly less third molars than their American counterparts. And he feels that I, that a lot of Americans uh, remove the four wisdom teeth simply because they exist. And the Germans like to think, um, do we have any data that shows this is going to cause a long-term problem? Do, do, do you, how do you explain the discrepancy between a higher percentage of wisdom teeth removed in America versus Germany? I think goes back on our training. Um, what, what's really interesting is that I have had an evolution in my private practice and my personal approach to that. I started out, I was, uh, you come out of training, I was much more aggressive. I taught, I taught more people out of having wisdom teeth removed and sometimes I risk upsetting my referral base because I, I disagree with them on certain cases. But I, I've moved toward the more conservative side. So. I I can see their point in Germany. I'm not seeing that it's you leave them all in, but there's got to be some good valid reasons that we we do these surgical procedures. And what percent of your practice would you say is um, exodontia versus uh, dental implants? So I roll out about sixty percent exodontia with uh, anesthesia, 
I'm playing about 30% implant bone graft and then about 10 uh, 10% pathology. Wow. That's the mix up. Wow. And and what did um what what did you want to talk about now? Did you want to talk about um um what what do you think would be a good subject? Um placing implants, extracting teeth. What what do you think would be good? Uh, you know what I most often get questions about is extractions. So we can go down that path if you like. Yeah, I'm my, happy to answer any questions. I felt very lucky. I went to the uh, University of Missouri Kansas City, and there's two oral surgeons there, uh, Dr. Brett Ferguson and Dr. Charlie White. And I believe Brett was the past president of the oral and maxillofacial. In fact, I think he's in Tennessee. Uh, do you know Brett Ferguson? I do not. Yeah, I think I think he's in uh, I think he's in Nashville um, or um, but anyway, um, uh, there were so many good lessons. And then, do you remember Matthias Horgan? I know the name. Yes. Yeah, he was an uh, oral surgeon. And what was neat about him is he was shipped off to Korea for several years. And back uh -huh. then, the oral surgery kit was a small, large elevator at a 150 to 151. And in dental school, you know, you're always trying to look for this ultimate force F, and you had this old military general gruff, Matthias Orgas said, <laughs> I spent four years in Korea, I can, but anyway, what he did, and I, I kid you not, when I tell people this, they don't believe it, but I mean, we pulled almost all the teeth just with a periosteal and a small elevator. I mean, it was, it was, it was, you basically had to beg to get a force up out of that guy. Um, and, and then his other lesson was um, whenever you couldn't get it out and you call for help, he'd always say, well, hell, I couldn't pull it out with that flap. I can't see it. He goes, you know, a right. two inch flap will heal the same as a one inch flap. He goes, spend your time. I, I want to see the damn thing. Then he'd go in there and double the size of your flap, peel it open like a banana. And then like, uh, just, you know, so, so talk about, uh, tips, um, uh, oral surgery that these young kids need to think about when they're trying to remove teeth. You, you, you go, you got me smiling because one of my, uh, one of my mentors back, uh, in dental school would talk about flaps and he said, those things don't heal end to end. They heal side to side. So he's like, make a wide, <laughs> make a wide flap, make a long flap. And I always remembered that. And it's true. Uh, visualization is key. I think case selection is uh, of utmost importance. And you, as you go through your practice, you, you, you learn the things that you want to do and the things that you would prefer not to do. And you, you get yourself into a bind a few times and, and, that's, and that's expected. I mean, you do this long enough, again, I say the dental gods, will, they'll, they'll humble you quickly. About the time you think you've got to figure it out, you'll catch something that, that surprises you. Um, so I, I think flap design is good. And, and I know there's all kinds of fancy names, but I learned it as an envelope flap, a three-cornered flap, a four-cornered flap, and now I've seen one, a variation of that that you could sit, could call a six-cornered flap. And that's basically all you have. That, that's what four, we do mostly. So that's four flaps? Did you say Pretty much four? envelope. The, oh. Yeah, envelope, three-cornered, four-cornered, and then a six-corner. So you really only have about four different variations on that. Three-cornered, four-cornered, and six-cornered? Yeah, that's that's the way the six cornered one I saw about five years ago, Tony Sklar down in Miami. I went to one of his courses and he would tuck back at the base of the flap. He he'd cut them back in a little bit so you could have, you would have six corners on that to get some better uh, advancement to to give you better primary closure with with no tension. So that's that's a, a newer one that I've seen. I didn't do that one in in my education or in my in my training, but that's one that's pretty cool. Huh, I've never I've never heard of that the four flaps envelope three cornered four cornered six cornered. Do you want to go into more detail uh, about that? Yeah, I mean the uh, the envelope is the one that we classically use. So you just take a third molar case. You got you go in, you make your incision along the the crest uh, of the third molar retro molar pad area. Uh, you may extend that up to say mesial of the second molar, and then you just dissect back. You've got that envelope flap. I use that one primarily for all of my third molar cases. Occasionally you'll get to a point where you need a little more visualization. I'll do a little dog leg off of the, the distal and that's a three corner flap. Occasionally you need to release the papilla and do a vertical incision at the mesial of the first molar. You, you reflect that way back. You can even score your periosteum. That's a four corner flap. And you, you, you can put that pretty much anywhere in the map, uh, mouth, upside down, sideways, or right, left. It, they're all the same. I, I have to think simply. 
And they all have these different names. If you look back at the history, they all got their names attached to them. But I, I just do it. I just do it that way to make my, make it easier for myself. And are you a Novocaine man, a Septicaine? Talk about anesthesia. So anesthesia. I am a I'm a lidocaine, marcaine guy. Uh, I will do bilateral marcaine blocks uh, on my lower thirds for the most part. I, I'm a fan of Septicaine for soft tissue. I've had I've had an incident twice in my career where I used septicane early on and I had I had some paresthesia and I know it's controversial but I had a couple of paresthesia cases with septicane on a mandibular block and and I've I don't go that route anymore just from my own personal experience so I'll use lidocaine marcaine primarily I, I don't do you think uh, I don't think marcaine's very very popular so they all know 2% lidocaine is that with a 1 to 100 epi or 1 to 50 yeah I use one to a hundred, and I use a half percent marcaine with one to a hundred. Those are my go-to's, well, and I do have well, some marcaine or septicaine. Yeah, but but talk about marcaine because a lot. Of, I, I I would guess ninety percent of the dentists under thirty listening to this podcast do not use marcaine. Do you agree with that or disagree yeah. with that? Uh, I I don't know. I don't know what they're teaching them or what they're training them. These well, we'll days, talk, uh, talk so about talk about the difference between lidocaine and marcaine. So so the the big difference is the. The onset's slower for marcaine, but the longevity is longer. So what I'll do, because typically we're removing more bone, the, the upper thirds come out a little easier. The lower thirds are most challenging for us, and the bone's a little more dense. So if you're taking bone to get those thirds out on the bottom, I'll give marcaine. You can get four or six, sometimes a little longer on your anesthesia uh, after surgery, so they're a little more comfortable. And they get home, they can get rested and get settled and they're not hurting as quickly. And that seems to play. The one thing that I do find is I get phone calls after hours sometimes and they're saying, I'm still numb, is this normal? And it, and it is for, for the use of Marcane. So that's that's the reason I use it. How, and I learned how, that from how my long do you think colleagues. they stay numb from in your practice from lidocaine versus how many hours uh, they on Marcane? I, I would say closer to a couple of hours hour hour and a, hour and a half two hours probably it's not that long for for lido yeah for my experience yeah and then how long for marcaine i'm saying about i'm saying about six hours six hours um yeah. when i got out of school in 87 in the 80s um for you i can't i don't even know what percent of the people listening to the show weren't even born then um we were the medical was the bad guy because grandma's over here dying of cancer and she's in pain and everybody was like, you know, you've got the technology. Give her morphine. What are you worried about? She's going to get addicted. She's dying. Uh, Dr. Kevorkian was out there saying, you know, we need euthanasia. Look how uncomfortable she is. You know, we should put her down. And we were the bad guy because we weren't prescribing opioids. So then the uh, pendulum swung and everybody started uh, switching. I mean, when I got to school, I mean, I mean that, that was just a rare deal. And then everybody started prescribing opioids. Now we're the bad guy again. Because now they're saying the you know uh, last year seventy two thousand Americans died of opioid addiction. That's more than the ten year Vietnam War. That's more than last year's uh, combined uh, accidents thirty thousand car accidents thirty thousand. Uh, and now um, now the pendulum swing back. I have friends in town who will not give a Vicodin or a Percocet for any reason whatsoever. And then there's a bunch of doctors who you know some still do. So what do you give for pain med and what's your thoughts on? our role in opioid addiction. You've obviously seen some of the articles that uh, some say that 17% of kids, their first experience was an opioid was uh, at the dental office. So so talk about opioids. Or oral surgeons in particular have been have it been implicated in this problem because of that fact. A lot of the a lot of the teenagers that come in haven't had a medical procedure or a surgical procedure and we're the first introduction. So that's that's some of the concept about how this is taking place that we're the gateway into that potential addiction and abuse um, I still do prescribe narcotics for acute pain post-surgical pain I limit it and we we counsel them what's really interesting is now we are even down to a lower dose we've we've structured everything in Tennessee we had a change in the law and they've they've really tightened up on us um, with the DA, of course, also being a part of that when they al stopped allowing us to call it in over the phone. Uh, so I think we're headed in the right direction. But as far as us primarily being the 
the the offender in this. I, I I can't say that I believe that, and of course I'm biased. But we have you know we have our orthopedic colleagues that you get something done you know with a long bone, and they'll give you 30, and then they'll give you two refills for Percocet of 30, so you got 90. Then we've got our, our chronic pain clinics that we see out there that have 120, 140 a month that they're prescribing patients. That that has to be a role too, and it has to be included in the conversation. Um, but I still prescribe narcotics. You know, I did a podcast with uh, uh, Wendy Gesson, and um, she's been in um, substance abuse rehab her her whole career as long as I have. We're about the same age. And she was telling me, and, and I've read it before, that um, a lot of the addiction overlaps with mental illness. That about, you know, like say in the United States, like 14, 15% of people have some substance use problem. And she said those people probably have some, they're self-medicating. That, that's her deal. She uh, says, she, yeah. she doesn't believe you give a healthy mind a beer and the next morning they're drinking it for breakfast. That people who, you know, some people drink a beer before they go to bed. But the ones that have for breakfast, they're self-medicating. So she, she, she actually thinks that um, if you have an addiction problem, you probably have a mental issue problem, and you should stop um, treating yourself with, you know, drugs, and you should talk to a mental health expert. Do you agree with that or disagree with that? Well, it's really interesting. You, I've I've been doing some recent study, and on that spectrum, man, I found this in a physician's uh, study. They were studying professional burnout or workplace burnout. And so you, you start on the left of the spectrum and go right. You first have workplace stress, the normal stress that we deal with day to day. And we can That's adapt to it as side. healthy people. That's a, that would be on the left side. Workplace uh, stress. Then the next, it, yeah, so as we move from the stress in our workplace that we can adapt to, we start getting overworked, we start having problems where we can't adapt to everything that's being thrown at us and then we move into what's a burnout what we all I've, I've used the term I've heard other dental colleagues use the bur, uh, term burnout then burnout is upstream of clinical depression and then eventually you can get into suicidal ideation and suicide so this spectrum is is where we're living at any given point and the healthy uh, the healthy people we can adapt I think once you get into the burnout, that can that can push us into these addictive behaviors, whatever that addiction may be, and uh, that's the way I have understood it in 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 my own reading about the topic. Yeah, I'm I'm sure it's a very complex issue. I I think a yes. lot of people when they're young think binomial up down left right on off. And a little like, like prison, like the United States has the largest prison population in the world. And I think 80% of them have three things in common. They didn't finish the 12th grade. They have a substance abuse issue and they grew up below the poverty line. And you got countries like uh, in Scandinavia screaming at the Americans saying, uh, putting him in a cage isn't helping him. I mean, he didn't finish 12th grade. Why don't you do that for him? He has a substance abuse issue. Why don't you put him in, in, in rehab and all that? And he uh, lives below the poverty line. Why don't you give him work training? And it seems like um, it's really changing because it seems like when I was young, everybody was right wing, you know, throw them away, throw them, you know, you can't put them in jail long enough. And now the science is kind of saying, uh, maybe there's more to being in jail than meets the eye. And a lot of it might be treatable. So it, that's more from a mental health state, maybe how people think. And I mean, they had the deck stacked against them. It has a couple of things there. You know, low or no education and then living up uh, living in a, a pretty austere environment and then how do you start to think about things you start negatively thinking and then that triggers you into these other behaviors and so I could I could I could support that I've only had uh, two surgeries my tonsils taken out and a vasectomy and, and after my vasectomy I asked for a Vicodin and he said the job was so small that um, an aspirin should just be fine. Um, so, so let's. Um, um, I, 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 you know, I, 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 I'm not here on a podcast to be someone's friend. I, I, I like to punch my homies uh, where it hurts if that's what's needed. But my gosh, it seems like to me half the dentists in America every time they pull a tooth, it's just an automatic pen VK 500 milligram 28 tabs and Vicodin 16 tabs. And a lot of scientists are saying that, um, you know, there's super bugs generating, which I don't know if I really believe that because 
90% of all the antibiotics made and sold in the United States are going into cattle, sheep, pigs, and chickens because it makes them fat. Um, but do you, but what do you think about my homie listening to you on the way to work? That ever, And then he says to me the lawyer thing. There's one million attorneys in the United States. He goes, you know, it's just CYA. I'm just covering my ass. I mean, uh, you know, so, so address that. Do you think everybody that gets an extraction should have a Pen VK 500 milligram? I think in my personal practice on third molars, I typically give, I don't give Pen VK, I give clindamycin. I give clindamycin 150 short course, three to five days, depending on how long the surgery is. But I also am a big proponent of chlorhexidine, and I know there's controversy about that, but the antimicrobial. And when you shift over and you look at somebody that has maybe Crohn's disease or some some uh, gastrointestinal stuff, I won't put them on clindamycin, but I'll put them on the uh, the oral rinse. Um, I, I'm a I'm still in the antibiotic camp. I still I still prescribe antibiotics. But you like clindamycin? What what dose is that? Clindamycin? What? I I usually I usually give clindamycin 150 TID, and I'll do a three day course or a five day course. Uh, if I do IV sedation uh, on implants, I'll I'll hang a I'll hang 300 in the in the IV bag, and that that seems to help. So let's switch to uh, from uh, uh, any other exodontia t- uh, tips. Um, I, I think a lot of it's fear. Uh, I, I see that uh, just just fear. So when I had the opportunity in residency to be in the dental school, I think one of the biggest thing is just people are are timid. And maybe that's not the right word, but you're timid when they go into surgery. Uh, so that I agree with that. Second, I think it's, if you think at any point when you're working on extractions and you, it runs through your mind, I wonder if I'm gonna need a handpiece, pick the damn thing up. Just use the handpiece. It'll make your life so much easier. If, if you've got them profoundly anesthetized, just pick the handpiece up and, and, and use the thing. Now, I, I think we work so damn hard on getting them out manually, and sometimes it's just a, it's just easier to pick up a handpiece and go. But some of them are even more scared because they think, well, my handpiece is air driven, and I don't want to cause an air embolism, um, and they don't have a slow speed. Can you use an air driven handpiece in oral surgery, or is that just an absolute no no? I'm a not I'm not a fan. I've I've seen air emphysema, and it's. It, it's scary as hell when it happens to you. I mean, usually this time will will cure that, but I I'm not a big fan of that. I've seen it happen in some of the clinics that I've been a part of. So I I, I use an O nitrogen driven hall handpiece is what I use. You so. drive a you use a what? Say that, sir. The the nitrogen driven hall handpiece. Nitrogen so driven met- hall H A L L handpiece. Yes, the, the train do I still use that. I've used the electric ones, but I, I don't see that they have as much torque. But if you're going to do a, a lot of extractions, get you get you a nice electric one. Um, you don't necessarily have to go and plumb med gases into your clinic. I mean, you can if you want to, and I do that. But um, I think some of the more more modern electric hand pieces work pretty well. Well, why did why did you go with a nitrogen driven hull hand piece as opposed to an electric hand piece? And do you are there any electric hand pieces that do you think? could substitute evenly for your nitrogen driven hall hand piece so i i would say in my hands no i've used a couple of the the electric ones i'm just not a fan of them and i trained on the hall hand piece so it's one of those oh ever i i trained here and i'm comfortable with it so maybe a comfort zone for me and i i've 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 used a couple of demos i just don't like them I just I, I can move quicker and I can section a tooth quicker and I can remove bone quicker with the whole hand piece. You know, I always look for um, just uh, you know um, mathematical variances in the two million dentists around the world to see what's going up, so you can kind of see you know kind of draws your attention to what to look at. And I'm amazed at how more dentists in um, Germany and Europe use electric than the Americans. I mean, Americans. I mean, you 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 could go visit four dental offices a day for a year and not and and they're all air driven what and but the germans are more electric and then americans complain about the noise of the air it's you know it's uh, but it's just kind of what you're born and raised on i mean it's like if you're raised yeah. in india you like curry if you're in the united states you like uh, sugar uh, and and if you start with it that touch air driven it's a totally yeah. different feeling to have an electric 
drill in your hand. I I, I agree. I agree. And that's that's a very good reason that I probably do what I do in the old nitrogen. And, and it's noisy, but I'm lucky most of my patients are sedated, so they don't they don't tend to complain as much. So so let's 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 talk her down from the lead. She's afraid that she's going to start pulling this tooth and not be able to get it out. She gets stuck. She only got it half out. Um, I've done it. Did it oh wait wait wait. Let, well, let's back up here a second. So she's up. She starts out afraid that she's not going to be able to get the tooth out. No no. Well, well she's afraid. I'm afraid. She's afraid that. This patient's coming in, I'm gonna pull that tooth. But what if I don't get it out? What okay. if the crown breaks off? Okay. What if I can't get it out? And then she feels like, well, I just can't send them to, I mean, the oral surgeon's gonna think I'm an idiot. Uh, I used to, I mean, I used to pull out, in, in 87 and 88 for the first couple of years, at least once a month, I'd only pull the top half of the wisdom tooth out, and then I'd have to send them, uh, <laughs> and either my me or my sister or receptionist would either drive them to uh, Don Gas, the oral surgeon during the day, and it was evening hours. There was a guy up the street named Bob Sunberg. And he used to just think it was so funny. He goes, yeah, Howard pulls out the top half. I pull out the bottom half. But they both laughed and helped me and taught me. And, and so that would stop. But but they're just afraid that's going to happen. So what what would you s tell her to do if that happened to her? What, what are you supposed to do? What, how, how bad is it? I think that it happens to all of us to, to begin with. It happens to me every week probably so I think you go back and you say all right if I think this is going to happen what are my contingency plans I know this thing if it breaks the crown do I have the proper equipment do I have the proper instrumentation because I find that in talking with some some guys out there and gals out there they don't have enough the surgical hand equipment to be able to tackle something like this so be make sure just make sure you have the proper armamentarium uh, armamentarium to do it have a handpiece in case you need to section that thing. Say it's an upper first molar and you need to cut the roots and take them out independently. Uh, that That's the first step. Knowing that you have all that you need on hand is, is helpful. And then if you get to a point and you work on them and you're just like, I just don't think I'm going to achieve achieve this, it's okay. That's what we do. Call your oral surgeon and explain to them that, hey, this has happened to me. It, hap it happens in here, here all the time. And I, I want to... I want to build a relationship with my referring offices that they feel comfortable calling me. Not going to get beat over that brow for doing something like that. Uh, and and I and I used to not be that way, Howard. I used to be a little bit more, a little bit more egotistical and and judgmental. But over a period of time, you you learn that it happens to the best of us. So don't 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 be ashamed to pick up the phone and call for help. Yeah, so I mean, I proper mean. Is, have the plan, proper instruments, and if you get in the weeds and you need some help, call somebody to help you. It's so, okay. So what what do you think made you on your journey switch from you say being arrogant, egotistical, judgmental against she shouldn't have tried to pull that tooth, she should have sent it to me in the first place, to where you're at now where you're more accepting and understanding and uh was that what 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 do you what made you change your, your mind on that? I wasn't getting I wasn't getting very far with folks doing it the prior way so I knew I had to change at some point and it was bothering me too um, so personal growth I think just understanding that sometimes we think we know we know more than we really do and you get a good dose of humility with when we talked about this in the little bit before we started recording about life life can knock you around pretty damn hard sometimes and you can either you can either accept that as a learning experience and an opportunity or you can you can uh, you can keep banging your head on the wall, whichever way you choose to go. And I, I elected to try and soften up and understand more. Yeah, I mean, I used to be against, uh, when I moved to Phoenix, I used to be so upset at the homeless people uh, on the intersection, always panhandling when you're trying to get on the interstate. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. I got involved with a, a homeless shelter and it was um, um, right away where I realized from the doctor there had been there 30 years that he said almost the, the only people that are homeless that get returned back to work in private sector, he said that's only about five to 10%. And then he told me the other 90% are schizophrenic. And, um, and you know, he's been doing it for 30 years. And then when, when you just learned that little bit that this person has a 90% chance of being schizophrenic and anything they do makes them feel better. If it's sniffing glue, heroin, meth, anything makes them feel better than their current state. And if you put them in a homeless shelter, 
the 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 four walls and the windows makes them go insane. They right be it makes sleeping. it worse. They they'd rather be sleeping on the sidewalk than in some in four enclosed rooms. And yeah, so it's it's not what you know. It's uh yeah. Well, that that's uh, good that you're humble uh, and all that stuff. Well, I I I I want to say, you 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 make a very good point. It reminds me of a story, and I'll tell this story real quick if you don't mind. So in Memphis, we had a general education building, and right across the street from that was a park. And several people that were homeless would sleep on those park benches. And so you're walking through the park going the, to and from the clinic and the cafeteria and whatnot. Well, three of my classmates decided that they were going to take one of these homeless folks in. Uh, it was a young guy. And so they take him in. They set him up. They get him an apartment, a small like economy apartment. They get him a job. They get him, give him some money to get his food. And about three weeks later, he's back out there. He told him, he's like, I appreciate it, guys, but I just can't. I just can't do that. It's just too confining. So you, you're, you're spot on with that. It, at least based on that story. And he's like, he was happier outside on that bench than he was with any responsibility whatsoever. So interesting. Yeah, interesting. and people say, well, I don't want to give that guy money. He'll probably go buy booze. Well, maybe if you were schizophrenic living on a sidewalk, there's a reason booze makes you feel better. It's just sad. Um, but I, I'm, another thing. Um, is this true or false? Um, when, when we look at um, paresthesias, and I, um, a lot of oral, a lot of um, dental malpractice comes from uh, paresthesia. Um, some people, mainly back to dental school, Matt Horgan, he used to always say this: Look, if you break off a root tip, he says, you know, you get a paresthesia going down there trying to dig it out and removing all this bone and hitting the nerve. He said, they, 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 um, it's not a problem. And he, he would even say a good size root tip, like maybe, you know, you know, four or five, six millimeters. He said, the body's going to work it out of splinter. He says, he said, you leave that root tip down there a couple of years later, it's going to be coming through the soft tissue and you can take it out with a pair of tweezers. But going down there and digging after it for half an hour is what's going to get you in a paresthesia. True or false? True. Nice. So it's ego. It's the young. That's what I think. It's just this young ego. Where this doctor just can't leave a root tip. I mean, he's a doctor of everything. There's a root tip. By God, I'm going to get it out. And that's when they start destroying stuff. And so, so what? Talk rant about root tips. Okay. So let me let me back up. I'm gonna I'm gonna go a little indirect on this. So you have. A person who comes in as fully developed third molar, say they're in their mid twenties. The only reason we're going to take them out is they have symptoms. You look at the, you look at your imaging, and you can see that the inferior alveolar nerve is in very close proximity to the root tip. I counsel the patient. I said, ideally, we would take the entire tooth out, but you have a significant risk that if we do that, we could damage this nerve. We can cause you to have a numb lip and chin for the rest of your life. They're like, I don't want that. I said, well, there's an alternative treatment called a coronectomy. We go in and we take off the top part of the tooth that's pressing on the adjacent tooth or maybe through the soft tissue with an oral communication, and we leave the roots behind. And most of the time, we never have to touch them again. If we do, they have migrated away from the nerve because they've moved up, like, like you were talking about, toward the soft tissue level, and we mitigate some of the risk. Uh, same thing with sinus. I mean, I typically, if I get a root tip in the sinus, I want to fish it out because I have seen some pretty sad uh situations with people with this big chronic sinusitis problems but i don't have a problem leaving a root tip i think the key to that is you you have a reasoning for it say it's you know the risk of removing or retrieving the root outweighed the benefit of doing so because of nerve potential nerve involvement and i document it such like that now you're in um lebanon tennessee or in mount juliet tennessee you're you have two offices right Lebanon and Mount Juliet. Right. Um, right. Do when, when do general dentists ever come by and say, "I want to observe and watch you uh, do oral surgery"? Is that does that happen much? Is that cool? Does that slow you down? Does the thought of that get, make you cringe, or is that fun <laughs> for you? What What are your thoughts on all that? Uh, no, I I have had multiple multiple folks come through my office and hang out and if it's their patient i don't care i mean come over anytime and and uh i find it i find it fun i like i like it because i'm a solo practitioner and when they come in we can talk and we can socialize and and i'm fine with that i have no issue with it and sometimes i get questions about well why are you doing this why are you doing that and i'll give them my personal reasoning as in my hands and my training the way 
uh, I do it and the reasoning behind it. And sometimes it's, it's, it's in disagreement with what they do and that's fine. We all have our own techniques and our own ways that work better in our hands. Um, and, but I don't, I, I don't have no problem with it. I love it. So you're 60 percent exodontia and 40 percent. Did you say 40 percent implants, or what did you say? Uh, 30, 30, yeah, 60 dental alveolar, uh, 30 percent implants and 10 percent pathology. So I get a fair a fair amount of pathology. More of the uh, geriatric population coming in for soft tissue stuff. It's what we primarily see. But I get a little bit of hard tissue. Uh, pathology. The is, big stuff, like if it's a real big thing, I'll send it to Vanderbilt, which is up the road here. And is the pathology mostly there? It's a suspect lesion, and they want you to biopsy it or look at it, or yeah, you get the discolored lesions, and uh, it's just. I think people sleep easier if if they know what it is definitively, and we could send it to the pathologist and get a get a read on that. Are you good for time? I know you're a busy oral surgeon. You good for time? Do you need to go? Or no, yeah. no, I've got. No, I, I've got a, I've got a few more minutes. We can oh, we can oh. go we can go a little bit longer. I I want I want to switch over to implants. I do want to tell you that um, I have podcast interviewed a lot of practice management consultants, and when they find an oral surgeon who only does exodontia, their overhead's about forty percent, and by the time their mm -hmm. practice is all implantology, their overhead's about sixty percent. Uh, so that tells you mm -hmm. implants a higher overhead. But but let's talk about uh, implantology. Um, these young kids are coming out of school, <clears throat> and if they're in America, they say, it seems like all the continued education on implantology is manufacturer driven. So do I need to pick an implant system because it seems like most of the courses are sponsored by the implant companies, or how, how would you, because I know what she's saying right now, she's saying, I graduated from dental school, I'm $400,000 in debt, and I didn't place one damn implant. Um, how does she learn, how, how would you recommend her on her journey to learn implantology? Uh, what system would you recommend? Where should she learn? Talk about implantology. Well, I, I'd come down that journey because in honesty, when we were doing a residency, you didn't start doing implant placement until your, your fourth year. Uh, it just in my particular program. We did so much, so much trauma, so much. Uh, reconstruction and orthognathic that was our focus and then you your third year you got to assist and then first assist on those implant cases and then your senior year you got to place and we used every system they had at that time I mean, we, we had seven or eight systems around there and it was just it was mind-boggling um, so the way I look at implants and the way I have elected to go is trying to look from a restorative standpoint okay what's the easiest restorative for folks, and and I know there's controversy as to who that is, and I have uh, I've elected to go currently. I use three I, and because they have the encode abutment, and it's just an easier restorative process because we use scans for digital imaging uh, and scan all the, the scan bodies. Um, as far as courses to learn how to place implants, it goes back to make sure it's based in sound science and research. And I also, I talked to a young man uh, this past weekend about continuing education. If you see all the pretty cases, Howard, in a, in a course, go up and ask, hey, do you have some complications you can show me? And if they don't show you your complications, because we all have those damn things happen to us, we all have unfavorable outcomes, then you need to probably look for another course to take, because they're having them. We have to share those too, because that's where we all learn. It's the space in which I think we learned the most. Now, when you does that make sense? When you say three I, is that Biomet three I um, part yeah, of which is now well, part of Zimmer? Uh, Zimmer bought them, so it's Biomet three I, and and uh, some guys over in East Tennessee turned me on to that, and we we've been using that, and they're they're very expensive uh, in comparison comparison to some of those fixtures out there, but. That was the reason we did it because it was easy for us because we were doing some of the, the scanning and the scan bodies you don't have to take off. They're one and the same uh, with the healing collar. And and I will tell you this, you, you mentioned, I'm going to go back and, and uh, a comment you made earlier. So with that mix, 60, 30, 10, with implants involved in my practice, I run about a 44.7% overhead. My goal is 38%. So it can be it can be done, and that's with a higher priced implant. Now, does it concern you that um, Biomet Three I well Zimmer? So when I was little, Three I was its own company. 
Um, yeah. They, um, they, they, M&A activity, they call it on Wall Street, mergers and acquisitions. Well, Biomet, uh, Zimmer threw their name in the hat for uh, a possible sell. Do you think they were just fishing? Um, have you, did, first of all, did you hear that or I, do you even care? I didn't even know what happened until basically right when it occurred, my, my rep came in and was saying, hey, there's gonna be a significant change possibly there's gonna be this happening and and that's the only way we knew it. I'm like, is you still gonna make the same implants, same system because it shouldn't change at least short term? I'm like, okay, and I, that's all I need to know. And you know, Strawman is I, the- I didn't, Stra I didn't worry. Strawman sells the most dental implants in the world because of mergers and acquisition. Yeah. They, bought, yeah. they bought Neodent yeah. Brazil, MIS in Israel. And when you and I just podcasted a Brazilian dentist the other day and, and they don't even know or care that um, a company in ah. Scandinavia bought Neo then it's still the same company. So so if still Biomed, the same implant, yeah. Yeah, so Biomed obviously they're not gonna close it down. If they sell it, the people who buy it sir wouldn't wanna uh, do anything. But there it's an interesting space. Um back to the holistic people. Um that um, you know, they don't want vaccines, they don't want metal. Do you ever think about placing a zirconium dental implant um, for the holistic people, or is the holistic people not really a common thing in Tennessee? demanding metal free. That's not, there are, there are some folks I've had some rare, rare occasions when I would have someone come in. There's, I think there's a, I think there's a guy in Nashville that does that. That's just not my space. And, uh, I don't, I don't know enough about them. So I would refer them out and I, they're just not my target market. Yeah. It seems, it seems like <laughs> I don't want to sound, uh, I don't want to hack anybody out, but it seems like that more holistic thing is more big in like San Francisco or Silicon Valley uh, uh, than, yeah. than, than Wichita, yeah. Kansas. I, I know people who uh, change their SEO marketing in San Francisco to be uh, off the grid, holistic, you know, some of these key buzzwords. Mm -hmm. And now they have people driving an hour to their office, of course, burning gasoline in their in their car so they can be more green. And, um, but but it, it, it's a different. So um, I can't believe I got uh, the only oral surgeon who does a podcast. Um, you got two sites. Where should my homies go? You got businessofdentistrypodcast.com and you got owner ownermagazine.com, own r mag.com. Um, where should my homies listening to you right now go? Uh, they can follow you on Instagram at owner mag. Um, then go to your own website, tnoralsurgeon.com. But where, where, where do you recommend them to go to hear more from you? Okay, if you wanna hear more, uh, if you wanna listen more on the podcast side of things, the Business of Dentistry podcast, that's that's my podcast, so uh, I do that. And uh, if you wanna see more of a multimedia approach than the owner mag, we have articles, it's all digital, so, and it's responsive, you can read it on your phone, you can read it on your iPad, on your laptop, so that's uh, multimedia. So we have some video, we have some audio, and we have some text. So we have two or three different ways that we can uh, uh, interact with you there. So See, my, they're both my, good platforms. Uh, my podcast producer, uh, Rebecca and Buster, they only want me to be on sound. They don't like me being on video. They say, dude, they, ah. can't, they can't see your face. You gotta do only sound and print, no more YouTube. Uh, no, but, uh, no, 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 disagree. That, do, do, Here's the thing, going back to going back to the media gateway and the media gatekeepers, the thing that's I think so important for what we're doing here is it is real. It's not some type of photoshopped, polished thing. It's authentic. It's a couple guys talking about things that they think are important and they're interested in. And that's the beauty of what we do, man. And hey, I'm good with it. You don't you can always turn that off and just listen to me. I, I, okay I know that. that's why I love user generated content. And that's why I call my podcast Dentistry Uncensored because you know, yeah, the, love the, the thing I noticed in 30 years of going to CE courses is that the speaker almost bores you and puts you to sleep. And then three hours later, he's at the bar drinking beers and, and he's the greatest on earth and keeps you up to one o'clock. Yeah. I'll never forget one day I was in a fishing boat catching redfish in off of Louisiana, off the swamp. And I'm just listening to the speaker and saying, why the hell didn't you talk like this yesterday? That was the most boring, pathetic life. But on the boat, he's telling jokes and he's being uncensored. So engaging. And it's like, keep yeah, it so real, engaging. dude. Keep it real. I mean, yeah. this, this politically I, correct you get stuff. So, yeah, you get so much further, I think, with, with people and your interaction and your connection with them when you can just be yourself and roll with it. And uh, 
I I agree with you. I'm I'm, I'm well. On board I'll tell with you that. what. A couple ways to explode your podcast. Number one, uh, sixty five thousand of the townies downloaded the app, and we have a place you can upload your podcast. Uh, it's for free. We have an app section. Oh, Roger. And the okay. den- the dentist that uploaded their app um, saw their um, subscribes on uh, iTunes and YouTube explode. And I, when I look at those articles of Owner Mag, I wish you'd put one in Dental Town Magazine. I wish you'd do an online C course. I, I just want more homies to know the man, Captain Kirk. Man, this has been fun. I I, I followed you and I, I listened to your podcast. I see your videos. I'm cool with the videos. Um, and uh, I, I appreciate you inviting me on. And it's been it's been a real pleasure. Well, it was an honor to have you on. It's Dr. Russell K. Kirk. Go to businessofdentistrypodcast.com. I hope you have a rocking hot day, buddy. Thanks a lot.